Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messi and today we are continuing our series on Canadian and British CBRN gear by having a look at post-World War II Canadian gas masks, starting with the C3. So the C3 was a direct descendant of the Canadian light anti-gas respirator, which was itself a Canadian manufactured version of the World War II British respirator anti-gas light. So this was introduced in 1943 as a more compact and lightweight replacement for the General Service Respirator Mark 7, itself a direct descendant of the World War I era small box respirator. So instead of having a separate filter canister attached to the mask by a flexible hose, the light anti-gas respirator had a lighter canister attached directly to the mask. Now, after the Second World War, Canada upgraded its light anti-gas respirators to create the NBCW protective mask number two mark two and they did this by adding an oro nasal mask to the interior and this serves two functions first it reduces the dead space inside the mask and makes breathing more efficient and second it isolates the nose and mouth from the eyepieces making them less likely to fog up now looking inside here you'll also see this mesh screen behind the exhalation valve and this is what's known as a vomit guard. This is so that if you vomit inside your mask this is going to catch the solid chunks while allowing the liquid to drain through. And this prevents those chunks from getting caught in the valves and interfering with their operation. Now this model was further upgraded to the number 2 mark 2 slash 1 by the addition of a speaking diaphragm to the exhalation valve which allowed the wearer to be more easily understood while wearing the masks and the fitting of an upgraded number four Mark IV head harness. Now, in the early 1960s, the number two Mark II slash one was redesignated the C3 mask. And as a general rule, the C3 and number two Mark II slash one masks were new manufacture, whereas the number two Mark II masks were World War II era light gas respirators upgraded to the C3 standard. Now, originally, these masks were designed to take American M11 and Canadian C1 cartridges, which had 60 millimeter threads. But when NATO switched to 40 millimeter as its standard thread size, then an adapter had to be made to accommodate the new Canadian C2 cartridges. You can see that right there. And here you can see an M11 and a C2 canister side by side for comparison. Now, while these masks differed slightly in their construction details, they all worked pretty much the same way having a resin impregnated HEPA filter for filtering out particulates such as radioactive fallout down to a size of about 0.3 microns, as well as a main filter element made out of activated carbon for filtering out chemical warfare agents. However, these masks were ineffective against carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and ammonia. And to learn more about how those gases can be filtered out, please check out my video on the MSA All Service Gas Mask, link in the description. Now, the C3 mask remained in Canadian service until 1985, when it started being replaced by the more advanced C4 mask. And this differs from the older model in five main ways. First, the filter cartridge can be worn on either side of the mask. And this is so that both right-handed and left-handed soldiers can shoulder their rifle without the filter canister getting in the way. Second, the speaking diaphragm was moved from the exhalation valve to a position just below it with this rubber cap to protect it during storage. There was also a second speaking diaphragm assembly that could be installed in whichever filter canister adapter was not being used. And this was for use with telecommunications equipment such as field telephones and radios. And just like the filter canister, this could be swapped to whichever side was most convenient. Third, the head harness was changed to this style, which has a large elasticated skull cap and only one pair of adjustment straps. And this is a lot easier and faster to don in an emergency. Fourth, the eyepieces are made out of molded polycarbonate, and this provides a much wider field of view than the old circular glass eyepieces. And finally, this mask is fitted with a straw, which slots into a special valve at the top of the soldier's canteen, allowing them to drink while still wearing the mask. And if we look inside the mask, we can see the other end of that straw, as well as the obligatory oronasal mask. Now, the C4 mask is still in use with the Canadian Armed Forces, but as of 2019, is slowly being replaced by the Air Boss Low Burden Mask, or LBM, officially designated the C5. 
So all of these gas masks would have been stored and transported in special carrier bags like this one, with the specific design varying depending on what pattern of equipment was being issued in any given era. And if you'll allow me a very long tangent, I'd like to briefly discuss the history of Canadian military webbing. So during the Second World War, Canadian soldiers fought using pattern 1937 equipment, just like the British and other members of the British Empire slash Commonwealth. And this remained standard issue for a couple of years after the war. In 1950, however, the Canadian government decided that going forward, it was going to adopt American weapons. And they started selling off their reserve stores of Pattern 37 equipment while they designed a brand new set of webbing to go along with said weapons. However, the outbreak of the Korean War in 1950 caught everybody by surprise. And since the new pattern of equipment was nowhere near ready for issue, Canadians fought in Korea using Pattern 1937 equipment and for the most part British weapons. Now, because of this, the Canadian government changed their mind and decided that they wouldn't be issuing a brand new system of equipment. Rather, they would issue a slightly modified version of Pattern 37. This was designated Pattern 1951 and started being issued at the conclusion of the Korean War in 1953. Now, the main difference between Pattern 1937 and Pattern 1951 was the waist belt, with the Pattern 51 belt having three rows of metal grommets, just like the American Army pistol belts. The shoulder straps were also thinner and flimsier than their predecessors, and a number of new pouches and carriers were introduced, including a mess tin holder and a compass case. But the most visible difference was the color. Rather than khaki brown like Pattern 1937, Pattern 1951 equipment was dyed olive green, with the brass fittings being painted black. Now this carrier bag for the C3 gas mask is easily identifiable as Pattern 1951 by the olive-colored canvas and the black painted brass hardware. And this is actually quite a clever design. It came with a system of straps that allowed it to be hung at the hip, on the chest, or if you are wading through deep water, on the shoulder. And this has a roll-up closure similar to what you might find on a dry bag. And indeed, this is capable of protecting the mast from brief immersion in water. But it had a quick-release fitting so that the bag could be very quickly opened and the mast easily accessed and pulled out. This has a number of auxiliary pockets on the outside for carrying extra straps, equipment for maintaining the gas mask, or equipment for detecting and treating the effects of chemical weapons. Though we'll have a look at those accessories in a later video. Now, Pattern 51 equipment continued to be used until the mid to late 1960s, when it was replaced by a brand new pattern known as Pattern 1964. And this was specifically designed with the realities of the nuclear battlefield in mind. So all the pouches were made of heavy canvas coated with a rubberized waterproofing compound. All the buckles were made out of green plastic, while extensive use was made of Velcro. The idea being to make the equipment easy to adjust and decontaminate. Yet while this equipment included most of the pouches and other accessories that you might expect, a canteen carrier, a bayonet frog, a gas mask carrier, etc., one item that was notably missing was ammunition pouches. Indeed, soldiers carrying the C1A1 rifle, the Canadian version of the FN Fell, were expected to carry their magazines in special pockets on the uniform tunic, while C2 machine gunners were issued a special four-pouch chest rig, colloquially known as the C2 bra. And no provision whatsoever was made for users of the C1 submachine gun, the Canadian version of the Sterling, with soldiers being forced to stuff their magazines into any available pouch or pocket. And the rather flawed logic behind all of this was that soldiers would be riding into battle aboard armored personnel carriers and were only expected to carry the minimum amount of equipment they needed to disembark and fight, with the rest of the equipment being stored aboard the APC. But in addition to the lack of ammunition pouches, there were plenty of other problems with this equipment. For example, the load-bearing straps were thin and tended to dig painfully into the shoulders. The equipment tended to slide around on the waist belt, while the Velcro lost its effectiveness when it became wet, causing pieces of equipment to just randomly fall off. And this forced soldiers to find all sorts of field expedient solutions, such as wrapping electrical tape around buckles and Velcro, replacing the braces with the load-bearing suspenders from US M1956 or M1964 equipment, or using earlier Pattern 1951 pouches to carry ammunition. In other words, this equipment was a complete disaster and much hated by the troops. 
Now, this gas mask carrier is easily identifiable as Pattern 64 by its heavy rubberized finish. You can see that this has the same roll-up closure as the Pattern 1951 carrier, only the quick release has been changed from interlocking buckles with to a piece of Velcro. Now, when originally issued, these carriers only had one attachment method, which was this pair of Velcro loops to attach the carrier to the soldier's waist belt. But this meant that it couldn't be carried separately from the web gear. And so eventually, the old strap system to allow this to be worn at the hip, on the chest, or on the shoulder was restored. Now, as you can imagine, issuing a new pattern of equipment across the entire armed forces takes time, which is why, although this is designated Pattern 64, this equipment didn't start reaching regular troops until around 1967, 1968. And it wasn't issued to reserve troops until well into the 1970s. However, by the early 1980s, the serious shortcomings of this equipment became glaringly apparent, and the government started issuing a new pattern designated Pattern 1982. And Pattern 82 was a huge improvement over Pattern 64. The pouches were made out of lighter and more durable Gore-Tex material. The shoulder straps were wider, padded, and more comfortable. The system had actual ammunition pouches, and the attachment system for all the pouches was more secure, consisting of plastic hooks that locked into grommets on the waist belt and were further secured using Velcro loops. And the system was designed to be modular, with three different configurations or orders building up from one another. So the base configuration was fighting order, which included the waist belt, the suspenders, two ammunition pouches, a canteen, a bayonet, a utility pouch containing grenades, ammunition, or rain gear, a gas mask carrier, and a pouch for the knife, fork, spoon, or KFS mess set, and the C5 pocket knife. The second configuration, battle order, added a utility pouch or butt pack to the lower back, which could be used to carry rations or other supplies to sustain a soldier for 24 hours. And finally, the third configuration, marching order, added the rucksack and sleeping bag. But while Pattern 82 was superior to Pattern 64, it still had its flaws. For example, the plastic hooks for attaching the pouches to the waist belt tended to snap off in cold weather, which, if you haven't heard, we have an abundance of up here in Canada. Also, the soldiers weren't a big fan of the rucksack and tended to privately purchase the older, lightweight rucksack to replace it. Nonetheless, Pattern 82 gear remained in service until the early 2000s, briefly seeing action in Afghanistan before being replaced with the more modern tactical vest system. So this last gas mask carrier we have here is easily identifiable as Pattern 82 by the synthetic Gore-Tex material and the green plastic hooks used to secure this to the waist belt. And just like the Pattern 64 carrier, this has a rolling closure with a quick release based on Velcro. So that is a brief overview of post-war Canadian gas masks and, as a bonus, infantry equipment. Now that's all I have for you today. We'll continue our series in the next episode with a look at the full NBCW or CBRN suits that would have been worn along with these gas masks. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.